All right, I'm preparing to situate his brisket in place. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this damp towel, which is what his face was wrapped in for the longest while. <clears throat> and I'm going to come along and I'm going to take this damp towel. I'm just going to run it down the hair. Press it in at all the details. This will help me discover any air bubbles that are hiding under the skin as well as push them all out very, very easily. Okay, you can hear a little crackling going on under the skin. And that's air pockets forming. Now that that's done, I'll go over the face a little bit. Now that that's done, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to apply a uh, hide paste to the brisket. Okay. Go now with this. The nice thing about this little fellow was he was shot far enough back that there are no holes to worry about repairing as part of the mount, which is good because this short hair is not conducive to a neat looking seam as far as the repairs go. Now, let me tighten this up. Just a bit. Now I'm going to pull the skin forward on the brisket. Now there was no paste applied this far down before the hide was pulled in place, before the hide was put on the form. This helps keep, it, keep things a little clean. So I'm going to get some paste now. Okie dokie. It's not going to require a lot, just enough to help hold the skin and taxi it into position. And you definitely want to get it right up to the back edge, the rear edge of the form, the very edge of the form. And you don't want to go too heavy, so just a nice thin layer, okay? Just like so. It's magically delicious. No. <laughs> and I'm going to spread some of it on the hide itself. And there's plenty of it here on this portion of the chest. So I'm going to take that and apply it to the hide. Get it here. Now, plenty of it pulled back to the top edge as the skin was brought back. So there is plenty of hide paste here. And just get a little more. I'll just spread around what's there and maybe put a little a little tiny glop add to it to ensure we've got enough. There. That's it. Now that's it. And that's all she wrote. That's all it needs. Now I'm going to pull the skin into position and then taxi it into place. And by that I mean I'm going to pull the hide back up into place, then taxi it, move it into position. Now into position here means I want to bring the armpits to their proper location. And I want to bring the skin forward a little, so I'm going to put my hands on either side of the chest piece and draw it forward just a bit, like so. Now you want to be careful because you don't, you don't want to overbring it, you don't want to overtaxi it too far forward, otherwise you'll end up with, you know, disturbances in the force, no, in the hide, and it will show, especially on this short hair guy. But I do want enough uh, armpit skin in the brisket. I want enough of the brisket pattern to show. Now, quite often, many taxidermists fail to bring this line of the hair where the back hair, back facing hair meets the forward facing hairs of the brisket. They fail to bring it 
not just forward enough, but over enough, over onto a little stump of the foreleg. And when you do that, you're denying the mount a really, what, what could be otherwise a very pretty little brisket area. Let me straighten this out. I'm going to bring the other side into position, then I'm going to show you how I trim the skin on the back of the brisket area. Okay, now here we have the, the cape, or shoulder area of the cape, well placed. I'm just going to simply press down into the brisket details. I'm going to continue to adjust the skin, make something nice out of this. Also, you can see right there, you see right there, you see the um, air pocket. Let me pop that. It's a hot pocket. Here we go. Here we are. There. Now, once the air is out of there, what I've done here, let me explain. I've brought the skin from the right side and the left side together up to form a bit of a peak. You can, you can leave it wide apart like this, if you like. I prefer to combine the skin on itself, and I get a much neater looking brisket. Plus, I've given myself more room to show the armpit or the front of the armpit detail. Now, go along and press this into the muscle structure on the lower neck and into the shoulders. And this will be gone over every day for about the first week. Pressing it down in contact. I used to line hide nails, 20 gauge hide nails, all down along the neck in all of these shallows and all of these depressions and into the details of the brisket. Now, until I get it stapled around the back, trimmed and stapled, I simply use one T-pin in the center, one T-pin up in the armpit where there's plenty of hair to disguise the hole that's being made, like so. And then I use a couple on the tips of the forelegs. Let me grab a couple here. And this is put here. Why? Simply to keep the skin from moving as I'm around back trimming it. And there are the pins put in place. See there, center in the brisket on the tips of the fronts, the, head, the heads of the, of the humerus. All my trimming is done with my paring knife, one of my paring knives. I just keep it good and sharp. Oh yeah, ouch. <laughs> First thing I do, the first thing I do, come in and I split the brisket in the center or the chest, the chest skin right down the center. Now I cut out a wedge. I go nearly up, nearly up to the, the baseboard. But I definitely cut a wedge. I'm 
when you cut a wedge out, you can bring the skin down straight and bring it together. Just like so, make a very neat appearance on the back. Same thing goes for the tips of the humerus, both sides, like so. All right. Again, I cut out, I cut away a wedge. What you do to one side, you repeat to the other. Or as they said in Gladiator, what we do in life echoes through eternity. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to grab my curved, my, my large curved scissors as soon as I find it right here. And with the curved side up, facing away from the back, I come in, I start trimming hair. Now, sure, the clients don't see it, but you know what? I know what's there. I know what's on the back of my mounts. Now, I'm going to put in my first couple of air stables. You see how neat that hide comes together? This is what you call Nidorino. Now, I'm going to attach my first staples. as close to the edge of the backboard as I can. One. Two. And I go along, put a couple more in. There. Now, I'm going to trim more of the hide away. But instead of cutting and slicing, I'm going to come along like so. Now, this knife is very, very, very sharp. I'm simply going to trace out where I want it to come away. And then, like so, remove it. This is the toughest skin you'll find on the mount. I'm going to take this Y cut that I made here. I'm going to try and eliminate some of the hair. Right here. Not going to get much of it off. Okay, I'm actually cutting away from some of the skin. Stretch that down. 
staple it. So, that'll be repeated on the other side as well. This is nice and neat. Now I come in. here yeah okay that grabbed the skin that's good right on the edge and here here now as I go along I take the knife and I start trimming it short. Fold this edge over and when you fold it over, you will notice there's hair standing on end along the very, very, very edge. Take your scissors. I take my scissors and I go in from there and I just start shearing away hair. I want to get the heavy hair removed. I don't want him to be mine hairy. I'm hairy enough for all of us. like so. And you can see this little edge here is all that there is. That, that, that's the only edge that goes around the entire perimeter of the backboard for the deer. And again, I staple it as close to the edge as I can, keeping it, keeping the staples, I should say, going into the, the wood, the plywood backboard. And these Matuska forms, like, like many forms today, are made real well with a real good placement of the backboard. That's what I like about new form of the new a lot of the new forms. They're really manufactured well. Trim off a little more hair, hair in there. Now this flap of skin that's here will be removed with the knife. Like so. Slice right down into it, pull it away. I'm going to even off the skin around the edge using the knife. Giving a nice neat edge to the hide as I go. This will be done all the way around. This gets done to every deer, every time. No exceptions. Press down heavy on the knife blade. Slice along. Get as close to the staples as I can. 
Believe me, this is a lot easier when you're not trying to do it for the camera. <laughs> this goes so much smoother when the camera's eye is not on me and I'm trying to get a shot lined up. There we are. Now, there we go. That's a nice, neat back on a mount. Some folks don't care. I do. I know what it looks like. In fact, part of my finishing process, or I should say during the finishing process, this gets a piece of felt cut and glued over the, the bare plywood backboard. But that's just me. That's my modus operandi. I'm going to continue trimming, shearing the hair, and stapling all around the back of the deer. You all don't need to see that. All right, we're all stapled, trimmed, ready to rock and roll. Trim down with the knife, give a nice neat appearance. Like so. All right, the next thing to be done, <clears throat> pull the pins. Oh, hold that down. <laughs> okay. I'll pull the other pins in just a momentito frito. What I do now. I put cardboard around the back to give the hairs a little something to dry against. These staples are arrow half inch staples. Come in, making the hairs lay flat under the cardboard. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Doesn't matter if it's easy or not. Basically putting a wall behind the mount. So, I have one more piece of cardboard and securing the back is complete. Like so. At this point, I'm just going to go along and brush the hair patterns in the chest. I want them to match up. Like 
conexão. Now there are little details in the pectoral region. I'm going to press the hide into them, into close contact with them. Like so. Brushing the shoulders. Brushing the pattern, the hair, in a downward pattern. In other words, I'm not just going back, I'm coming at an angle toward the center of the neck. And when I stand the deer, turn the deer upright, stand him upright, the pattern will be coming from the back down. Right here on the shoulders, there's detail be pressed into place and I'm doing that as I go right now we're going to bring them up this is what I was talking about as far as in regards to brushing coming down down not straight back, but down. If you've ever brushed a horse, for example, you'll notice, hopefully you'll notice, the directional growth of their coat. Well, a deer, the deer, the coat of a deer, moose, caribou, grows the same way. It grows in a downward fashion. It doesn't grow straight back. That's why the mane on a horse, when it's allowed to grow out, the mane will flop and grow down one side or the other. Now here, I've got an air bubble, an air pocket, right under the skin on the cheek, right here. See it. I want to eliminate that, but it's right here. I'm going to pop it. Make sure I get in between the hairs. I don't want to cut any of the hairs. Two holes, no waiting. Two holes, no waiting. One more for good measure. Now there's actually a jaw a, a jawline. You can actually make out the line of the jawbone under lo the lower mandibles, which is very correct. Plus, you'll only see it if the deer is hanging way up. But the fact that it's there means that it should be emphasized, not overemphasized. Just not emphasized. overemphasized, but emphasized enough. Now I'm pressing the cape into tight contact with all of the muscular indentations, the little back of the jowls or the cheek. And this is what needs to be done over the course of a couple of days. I got a wider brush to take down the hairs in the proper place. Okay. All right, you little monkey. There we are. Pressing them into contact. This will be done every day. Pressing, them, pressing the cape into, into tight contact with the form and working out any air bubbles will be done every single day 
until the skin tells you, hey, I'm dry and I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the right place and you don't have to do this to me anymore. It will tell you. It will tell you. It will tell you. You just have to listen. tendency, as with all deer heads, is to use the antlers as a handle. Well, that's a wee bit of a problem with this soft little guy. Well, actually, they're not soft, but, you know, you don't want to yank the velvet off. So you have to be very, 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 very aware, very cognizant of the antlers and what you're doing around them, and you have to make sure you're not banging anything into them. going to go around the eyes one more time. Make sure the skin is all in the correct place and that it's tight. The eye skins are actually beginning to dry at this point. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and remove the plastic from over his head. And I'm going to start uh, fine-tuning him and tweaking him a little bit here and there. Come on, little man. Let's get your hat off. There we go. Very nice. Oh, my goodness. It looks so pretty. <laughs> there we go. There's a big boy. All right, we're looking good there. You grab a pin. You can use a three-corner needle for adjusting the eyes. You can use a T-pin, whatever. As long as you can get in, hit the root, bring the feelers forward. Let me get my stronger glasses on here. With, with age come, comes wisdom and terrible eyesight. Ah, uh -uh. oh, look, there we are. Modeling tool. Brushes. Right. Bloody well right. Okay. I want to check the skin at the front crease of the eye. Make sure it's down tight. I want to check the skin entering into the lacrimal gland. Make sure it's pushed in. Bring the lacrimal gland over and down. Run my hand over the facial details. This is everyday stuff. For the first couple of days, this is what's needed. Now I've got a small brush here to go along with my wider brush. This is a little brush I picked up uh, from Matuska Supp Taxidermy Supply. It's a Kemper tool and it's real great for getting in and, and getting hair brushed where you don't want to use a big brush for fear of messing with the details or what have you. It also has a smaller end. This is the Kemper tools brush, double end brush I was talking about has a cone-shaped brush on one end and what looks like a little mascara brush on the other end. Now the nice thing is with this little mascara type brush 
you can get under your eyelashes and be sure you separate your eyelashes. You can actually brush the eyelashes. Make sure they're in the proper position. Works the same as using a needle tool or a pin on the peeler hairs. But yeah, it's like a mascara brush. Now, what I was doing before, now that we're in close up, checking the placement of the front skin crease ahead of the eye. and putting it the bottom skin behind the lacrimal gland and pushing that skin forward and into the lacrimal gland then bringing the lacrimal gland down again tight with the modeling tool see the modeling tool there's no give as there is with the finger so if you use this to press against the clay it will go a long way to flattening this detail. And you look at them from the front and that's all good. And the coolest thing about using the CA glue to adhere the nostril skin is that there's no need to plug the nostrils with paper or wads of plastic to make sure the skin stays down. Using the CA glue in the nose ensures that the skin will stay down. One thing you have to be careful of is that it will crystallize on the hairs. And that's where you have this little brush come in and help brush some of the crystallized hairs out of the nose completely. This can also scrub some of the glue off the hairs as you go in. And it will also pick out some of the clay, as you can see. That's what's happening here right now. We're getting some clay out of the nose that got onto the skin as we pressed the details of the skin down. And there we are. It's a little lovely nose detail, nostrils. Okay, I do this on this side here as well. Make sure the skin is still making tight contact where it needs to be. Get up under there with the modeling tool and check it from the other side with the light. We're doing good. Now at this point I'll check how the bottom lid is drying. But I'm sorry. At this point I'll check how the lower lip is drying. And this is drying nice. I'm going to push it. Make sure it's pushed up. I'm going to push from the bottom of the lower lip. I want to push up on that. I want to re-emphasize the cleft down the center of the nose pad. Now I also want to take the tip of this wooden tool and push in a bit on all of the little hair roots. I want to create little dimples in them. And this is better done the next day. Only because the clay has had a chance to set up overnight. I 
I just want to create little dimples all around the nose pad, wherever there's a little white hair. <clears throat> also, at the back of the nose pad, where the bare skin meets the hair, where the bare skin meets the hair, I'd like to press in just a little and just emphasize that area between the two. Not a lot, just enough. And I'm going to run my hand over it and gently even everything up. I'm going to do this on the other side as well. That's what having the clay under the nose pad area enables me to do. Now, he has a definite definition where the nose pad is located. Also, I'll go around the front edge of the nose pad and emphasize where the dark nose pad meets the hair again on both sides. It's very very subtle but it will go a long way during the final finishing process. These are some of the little things I do on the second day. This is the second day of completing the mount. And let's adjust this lower eyelid here, just a touch, just a touch. Be sure that the left eye matches the right eye. Okay, I gotta bring this eyelid down just a bit. I know you're not seeing what I'm doing, that's why I'm narrating it. Very nice. That's a beautiful match. Okay. Okay, you can accentuate this jowl, the masseter muscle here, just a wee bit with pressure from the finger just ahead of it. You see there's a little bit of paste and air bubbles being pushed around. Go behind it to emphasize it. like so. That really makes a difference in how it shows up. Now, I do this to every deer, not just deer with short coats. Okay, this hide does hold it in place. That's the neatest thing about this. Pro on hide paste. I can't say enough good about it. I cannot say enough good things about it. Now we straighten out the coat. And you can feel all the detail coming through. Actually, you can see it right here. You can even see the base of the facial vein coming through as I press. That's that little line that's appearing right here. Okay? That's part of the facial veining. It's showing up. Shows up even more in very short hair deer. Now that, if you want, you can emphasize a bit by building it up with some uh, uh, epoxy sculpt. But I wouldn't go overboard with it because unless a deer has been running for his life and gasping, you know, he's got his mouth open, tongue hanging out, that vein is not going to show a whole hell of a lot more than what it shows on the sculpture. And by simply working the skin every day, you can get those details to show. Now, I'm sure no one has ever thought of using a hammer to tweak things. But using my 3D reference, I can see where there are several areas I might want to tweak a little more than I have been, or than I have before at the front of the ear. Now right here, 
because the clay is beginning to set up nicely. We can reproduce this little divot right here. And the shape along the bottom, we can get that to match. Now I'm not just banging around, I'm tapping down and back. And I go around the back, I tap in and upward. Now, having that mashed around a bit, I can get in there with my fingers and further fine tune it. And tweak it. Like so. And I've done I've done the same method. Or I say should use I should say use the same tool to accomplish this method at the back of the ear using the tack hammer. It's a light hammer. So you don't have to swing it mightily. You know, you're not a you're not the village smithy with arms like iron bands or Iron Man. Now we bring the coat into its correct brushing. We come down the back. Bring the direction of the hair in the correct growth pattern. Correct growth pattern. While also running your hands over the details on the shoulders, pressing these features down tight where the front of the shoulder meets the base of the neck. We have a um, pocket here of either paste or air or both. Three little hits with the large three-cornered needle and that's gone. Now what this is is paste that's rolling towards the back. I don't want it to roll completely out from under its place. I'm not making like a tube of toothpaste and trying to move the paste forward. But I am trying to get all the details secured where they belong. Without, I might add, the use of hide nails. I used to at one time, I was a big proponent of using hide nails. You had to be. The paste I had previously, and I, I, I do love the dextrin-based paste. I mean, it's inexpensive. But this may be a little pricier, but the results are that I have adhesion, skin to form adhesion like I've, I've never had before. And that to me is more important than just keeping a tradition alive for the sake of keeping a tradition alive. I'm going to continue working the ear base on the other side. But this is where I am on the second day. One of the things that takes place tweaking without the heavy handed use of a hammer is putting the wrinkles at the front of the ear. The ear base, I'm sorry, the ear butts. Now hold the ear from the back so that it this doesn't push it out of place. And you work 
the skin into wrinkles which you can then you can then brush if you wanted to overemphasize the wrinkles you can add a little bit of hair setting gel and really push them into push the hair that is into the wrinkles that have been formed and I can show I can show you that if I can find my oh my hair setting gel is right here right in front of me but you can go over and really press the hair or I should say press the the gel into the hair then with the brush go over and further press the hairs into the wrinkles using the brush. Now after this dries this will show even more than it's showing now. It's barely showing because once hair gets wet of course it's flattened but yeah there's wrinkles in the front of the ear in front of the earbuds right now. If I can create a shadow over them. Oh not so much. Well we'll see it again when this deer gets finished and this deer will be finished in a separate set of videos on camera. Okay. So does it for day one of the Woo. <laughs> so does it for day one of the tweaking process. Uh, he'll stay the entire day uh, just to the open air to dry a little slower. This evening, before I go to bed, I'll come down, put the plastic bag over him, and repeat everything I did here today tomorrow. That will continue for two or three more days, I would say until the skin has really begun to tighten up and dry up. So, everything is good. Just remember, when you go over the hide, pressing your hands against the hide, and you hear any little crackling sounds, that's a good bet that there are air bubbles under the skin in that location. And there's nothing better for killing air bubbles than a good three-cornered needle. Three-cornered needle is our friend. So, I'll let him continue to dry today. And um, I won't necessarily have to check back on him tomorrow on video unless something drastically happens like his ears fall off. But uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So, in the meantime, we'll see you on the flip side. Well, he's finished as far as the mounting goes. Now over the course of the next couple of days, he'll be drying. Uh, I will constantly press the skin into the details on the mannequin, just as I'm doing here. Overnight, he will be bagged, unbagged tomorrow. Uh, his features refined, the ear butts shaped a little more. Check, make sure the eyes are drying properly. He needs to get checked over, all over. His skin is very, very thin in places, and he's a beautiful little buck. I know my clan's going to be happy with him. Well, <clears throat> I hope this whole thing was educational for you. I hope it was entertaining, and I hope you got something out of it. So until the next time, adios amigos.